1 Peter, the fifth chapter, one of my favorite verses, verses 10 and 11. So as you find that, I'm going to invite you to join me in the preaching process and stand with me as we honor the Word of God. Unlike any of the Word or any of the book we may own, read, or discover. Again, 1 Kings 17, 17. Familiar story. We're added to the witness out of 1 Peter 5 and 10. Amen? Amen. Now, I am going to put you on the fast track this Sunday. Uh, we are all uh, aware, I'm sure, of the uh, impending snowstorm that is supposed to start shortly. Uh, in addition, we do have communion. I'm going to go right from the sermon into the communion. Uh, and the Lord be with us. We'll be able to get out ahead of the storm. Amen? Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring, bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? He said to her, give me your son. And so he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. And then he cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. The soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, now your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Amen. Amen. My God. Thank you, Lord. Let's go over to the witness. First Peter, if you have it, first Peter very familiar passage one of my favorites but may the God of all grace who's called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while perfect establish strengthen and settle you to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever let the church say Amen. Oh God, our Father, we turn to you now. The only one that is able to establish, settle us, and present us faultless before the Father and his holy angels. We wait on you. This day, this moment, this hour, we wait on you to help us to make it through the suffering that we must endure. Not to break us, but to make us into what you would have us to be. So use this message, Holy Spirit. Use the words out of the holy book. Use the words out of my mouth. Not that they be my own, but let them be the words of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Encourage us. Give us the strength to stand. Until we can receive the hope of our calling. And see the one we love and adore. The one called Christ Jesus. All of God's people said amen. 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 Amen, amen. amen again. You may be seated all over the house of the Lord. 
I'm going to talk to you today about an endorsement from God. An endorsement from God. A political endorsement is the action of publicly declaring one's personal or a group's support of a candidate for elected office. In a multi-party system where one party considers that it does not have enough support to win power, prior to an election, the official representative of that party may give an official endorsement for another party that they consider more likely to be a successful contender. Endorsements are desirable because they raise the profile and awareness of a candidate and often enlarges their personal base of voters and supporters. Endorsements from certain organizations and even from certain people can make or break a candidate's successful run for office. But an endorsement from God, more powerful, more potent, more prolific than a political endorsement, an endorsement from God can lead to eternal life. Amen. Amen. Hey, as we look at uh, this story tucked here in chapter 17, I would like uh, for you to go back and I just want to read what are those? I want to read verses 8 and 9. Chapter 17, just outside of our primary text, just these two verses, 8 and 9. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Zarephath. Zarephath is a town on the Mediterranean coast about seven miles south of Sidon. Elijah was sent there, was sent there to live for a period of time. And this was a territory that was controlled by Ahab's father-in-law. That's Jezebel's dad. And his name is Ethabal. And by doing this, God showed his power in the very area where the impotent God Baal was being worshipped. Are you with me on that? Zarephath was the home court for Baal. That's where he had his most power. That's where he had his most servants. That's where he had the most dedicated to the worship of the false god of Baal. Now look at somebody and say, ain't your God funny? He didn't send them to Jerusalem. He didn't send them to a city of Judah. He didn't send them where there were prophets still believing in God. He sent his, his servant to Zarephath. Touch him on and say he's sending you to Zarephath. Right, right. Not so that he can destroy you in Zarephath, but God needs to put you in an in possible situation so that God can do what only I wish I had a real church I gotta hurry the snow's coming but but you gotta let it you got the story don't make sense if you don't know anything about Zarephath but that's where he sent them he sent them to Zarephath and it was here that he found this widow woman amen this little woman is surrounded by Baal worship. The idols of Baal were on every high place. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing idol worship to God. And some theologians surmise that this woman herself may have been a Baal worshiper. Am I right about it? Here we go. 1717. Here it is. Now it happened. 
After these things, these things being how uh, Elijah, through the power of God, fed himself, this woman and her son, with uh, flour and oil that never ran out during the drought. So it says, after these things, the son of the woman who owned the house became sick and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. Yes. Amen. So she did a miracle. I got flour and oil that never runs out. So while other people around me are starving, I am living off the power and promises of God. Amen. Touch somebody and say that would preach. That would preach. All around her is a drought. People are literally starving to death. But because she met a man from God. I wish I had a real church. I'd finish this. But, 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 but she's got a miracle. But it doesn't last. Because the story picks up and says, after a period of time, her son became sick. And to her, her son was her lifeline. Why? Because the story writer tells us she was a what? A widow. She had no man, no husband to no longer provide for her. That's why the man of God was such a blessing to her. Because if you recount the prior story, she tells the man of God, I'm going home to fix one last kick for me and my son so we can die. Because I don't have any other support. I don't have any other way of making it. But the Lord stepped in and said, no, I, I, I will. he steps in and said, I'll be your husband. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll provide what your husband is no longer able to provide. But what do you do when God stops providing? <laughs> it's all good as long as the flower doesn't run out. It's a good thing as long as the oil keeps flowing. But what do you do when God's miracle stops? Look at someone and say, you keep trusting God. Because if he can do that miracle, he can do another one. He said, look, he's sick. Not only is he sick, he died. And so she comes to the prophet who is now a guest in our house. Comes to the prophet and says, what have I to do with you, man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? Here it is. Not all trouble is the result of sin. Even though sin is the cause of all trouble. Sin is the cause of all trouble because the creation account causes us to understand that everything God made was good. Everything he made was perfect. It was to the specificity and the details of what he had in his mind. And God bore witness to his own work and at the end of the day he said it was good. But then with the entrance of the serpent who was not good in his spirit but became overcome with pride and arrogance and is kicked out of heaven he goes down into the earth and he beguiles Eve and Eve convinces her husband Adam to go against the word of the Lord and when sin entered the world it corrupted God's creation all aspects of it because out of the entrance of sin God now curses the ground the man and the woman they now bring a curse on themselves that which just a moment ago was good perfect without blemish spot or wrinkle has now 
been cursed. And now and now everything in God's creation has been troubled and is now being contaminated by evil. But this is what you got to know about the big story of your Bible. The big story of your Bible is that is how it started. But when it ends, Christ is going to return creation back to God exactly the way it was the only difference is that it will have inhabitants in Jerusalem who are called the redeemed these are they that have been washed in the blood these are they that were born in sin but through the sacrifice of the holy lamb of God they have been redeemed and have passed from death unto everlasting life. In the original creation, there were no redeemed. Why? Because they were made perfect without sin. But now that sin has entered the world, God, that through Christ Jesus has been what? Reconciling the world back to, you know what I mean? He's put, uh, uh, reconciling is what an accountant does. They get the books back in order. <laughs> yeah, your checks and balances, your, your debits and credits aren't working out. So I've got to send an accountant in to reconcile the book. Why? And put it all back in order. Yeah. Amen. How many of you knew your God was an accountant? That's what Christ was doing on Calvary's cross. He was putting the book, I wish I had a real church, back in order. He was looking at your life and my life and realizing that the debits and the credits, you're an accountant, were out of whack. And God, unable to find a suitable sacrifice, sent his own son, his only begotten son, to reconcile the books of your life and my life and what was once out of order. God, God, God has put back together again. Say Now listen. He tells the man of God, are you kidding me? Did you come just to remind me of my sin? Is the reason you chose me versus all the other women who are at the gate is because you wanted to kill my son? Listen, trouble makes all of us say and do crazy things. Yeah. Amen. 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 She said, is that why you've come? You wanted to kill my son? Is that why you've come to remind me of my sin? couple things in her thinking have you come to re to bring to my remembrance my sin that's not why Christ comes Amen. Christ comes to forgive us right, right. of our sins and then as the psalmist says he casts them into the sea of forgetfulness Amen. so that's not why he comes right and he says to kill my son and if God wanted to kill your son why would he have sustained them for all these many months? If he was going to kill him, just kill him at the beginning. Right? But because she is grief stricken, because trouble has now come to her house, it clouds her judgment. Even though she is a recipient of the miracle working power of God. 
let the church say Amen. look at somebody say it can happen to you Amen. help me preach look at him and say it happened to me last week I know what the Lord has done I know where the Lord has brought me I know the doors that he's open but because a new season of trouble has come into my life how easy we forget that's why Jesus said do this in remembrance touch somebody and say don't forget we forget that he's got resurrecting power we forget that he's got healing power we forget that he's got miracle working power we forget that he's got door opening power we forget that he's got way making power we forget that he's got cancer curing we forget that he's got financial we forget that he's got emotional spiritual that's why we need the words of the testimony now watch this this is worth the whole sermon right here John the ninth chapter the whole chapter deals with the healing of a blind man but here's the opening conversation now as Jesus passed by he saw a man who was blind from birth and his disciple asked him this his disciples representative of all people rabbi who sinned the man or his parents that he should be born blind that's how the world thinks if something is wrong it's because of something you have done that's why you're in the trouble you're in that's why your marriage is in the condition it is something you did that's why your finances are the way they are it's something you did or something you didn't do but how many of you realize not all trouble is the result of sin even though sin is the cause of all trouble look how Jesus answered the boys Jesus answered and said neither this man nor his parents have sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him Elijah didn't sin but yet and still God sent him to Zarephath the woman the little woman had not sinned yet God placed her in Zarephath not to destroy her not to destroy her son nor to destroy the prophet of God but that the works of the Lord the power of God works best in Zarephath oh God I quit I quit in Jerusalem anybody can get the credit but in Zarephath there'll be no doubt there'll be no question if it had not if I was in Jerusalem you would give the credit to the priest if I was in the church you would give the credit to the pastor but who do you give the credit when you're living in Zarephath the home court of the, of the serpent himself God said you're here because I'm getting ready to do something 
I'm about to give an endorsement to your life, to your faith, to your faithfulness, to your commitment. But you know how the politicians do it. When they got something big to say, they have a press conference. And they always do it in some place that has significance to what they're saying. God said, I'm having a press conference. And I'm not going to have it in heaven. Nor am I going to have it in Jerusalem. But I'm going to do it in Baal's backyard. Down in a city called Zarephath. That's where I'm going to bring my man of God. And my woman of God. And they're going to stand with me behind the podium of God. And I'm going to prove to the world that there is a prophet in Israel. And he serves the Lord God Jehovah. All right, let's get on. Get on with it. Get on with it. Verse 19. Here it is, women. This is for you. If you get this, you got your sermon. You looking at verse 19? Do you see it? You see it, Sister Helena? This is your testimony. Flower and oil, great. Sun dead, not so great. Now, she does what most Christians do. She blames God. And why does she blame God? Because what? Out of that oil and flour, guess what she was doing? She was tithing. Out of that oil and flour, guess what she was doing? Feeding the man of God. Literally, he was eating out of her hand. Every morning, faithfully, she baked bread. Not, you got to go back to the story. Not for her son and herself first. The first piece, the tithe, always went to the man of God. What do you do when your tithes stop blessing you? What do you do when your prayers are no longer answered? As long as they were answered, you kept praying. What do you do when your faithfulness goes unnoticed? As long as everyone said thank you. And as long as everyone was blessed by what you were doing. But what, what happens when you continue to do it? And the thank yous get less and less. What do you do when you faithfully serve God? And no one serves you. She does what we all do. We blame God. So look what the man of God says. Says to her, give me your son. What is so significant about her son? Her son represented her future. I have no present because my husband is dead. I'm making it because the Lord has sent me a man of God. But what happens when a man of God leaves? Hey, it might not be so bad if my son is of age. Then he can go out, work and earn and provide an income so that we can continue to have bread and oil. Yes. Look at how her thinking shifted from God being her provider mm -hmm. to her son being her provider. She went from supernatural provisions to natural provisions. Are you guys with me on this? Listen, listen, because we all do it. 
every time God blesses us, we look for a way to replace it. You don't have to say anything. The fact that you're not saying anything says everything. And I know I'm telling the truth. Every time God blesses us supernaturally, we immediately begin to look for a natural replacement. Anybody know why? We do it because our faith has not matured enough to believe that what God has done today, he can, will, and even supersede it tomorrow. And because we don't believe for that, we begin looking for a replacement. Look what God does. God looks at the woman through the eyes and mouth of Elijah. He says, give me your son. Give me your hope for tomorrow. Give me the thing you have the greatest confidence in. Because the reality is, that's your God, yes. not me. Amen. Are you with me on this? Amen. And so if you guys are going to work this surrender thing, you can't give up something easy. Anything you give up easy, that's not what God wants. I'm telling you that now. If it's easy, if it doesn't cost you nothing to give it up, doesn't cost you nothing to do without it, God don't want it. I'll tell you that now. Save, save yourself and God time. When God wants something, he says, I want the best lamb. I want the first lamb. God said, I'm going to eat first before you do. God said, don't give me a lamb that's got a spot, a blemish, a broken leg, a broken hoof. No, you keep that. God said, I want your best. Does anybody know why God wants our best? Because he gave us his best. How dare we give God anything less than that? But look how foolish we are. That's what we give him all the time. We give God the leftover. We give God the stuff we didn't want anyway. Here, God, take this. I was getting ready to throw it out in the, but instead I'll give it to God. Elijah said, don't make a sacrifice. No bread, no flour, no oil. Give me your son. How many of you are willing today to give God your best? To give God something you hold dearly, preciously. Sister Helena's testimony is that she had to give up her kids. That's what God wanted. And until she surrendered that, God didn't move in her life. What will you surrender? What are you going to give up in exchange for the blessing of the Lord? All right, let's finish this message and get out of here. Give me your son. Verse 22, then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came back to him. And he revived. He came back. 
back to life. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see now, your son lives. So look, I was just kind of hard on him, Dad. And anytime I'm hard on you, my dad always looks at me. Because he cares more for you than I do. He always got his hand up. You ain't got to go so hard. Listen, listen. You know why I went so hard on that? Because if you get this, it'll be worth it. Everything she gave up. Do you see it? It's in the text. Her hope. Her joy, mm -hmm. her retirement, mm -hmm. her former, the, the, the final payments on her. Oh, she gave it up when her, but she gave it to the Lord. Yeah. And unlike when he died, when she gave, this is where you miss it. This is where we miss it. The son dies, she what? Complains. Right. God says, give him to him. And she does what? She keeps her mouth this is where you grow the real church this is for real believers this isn't for cute but this is real believers it's not only do you got to give God your breath you got to do it with your mouth and you got to finally do what the book tells us to do and the book tells us that the just shall walk by faith When you really walking by faith, look at me, really walking by faith, you don't say nothing. You don't tell nobody when you're really going through. When it's a, oh yeah, pray with me, yeah, that ain't it. <laughs> Anything you want me to pray with you about, that ain't the real thing. <laughs> the real stuff, you don't tell the pastor. The real stuff, you don't tell your companion. You just walk it out. <laughs> By faith. Just hoping and praying and believing God. If you would just one more time answer my prayer. She gives the son, never says a word. Elijah returns the son back to her and says, Look now, behold, look and see what the Lord has done. And what he's doing now is what he wanted to always do. But your husband had to die first because he was a God in your life. You had to almost go through starvation willing to come and commit suicide on yourself and son now your son is dead you go into a state of hysteria and depression only because God said this is where I needed you to come Amen. had I taken you any other way you would have never gotten here read her testimony you read her testimony she says now I know. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean the miracle of the flour and oil didn't do it? It got her going, but it didn't seal the deal. That's why she still believed in her son more than God. God said she needs another touch. Another miracle is required to bring her. Listen, listen. Some of you need another miracle to make the final step. You're just outside of what he wants to do in your life. And you've got miracles. You've got stories. You've got to. But there's one more test. That when God brings you through this, this will be your testimony. She said, now I know. Now, now. It took my son dying and God giving him back to convince me 
of the power of God to cause me to know on a deeper level the love of Jesus Christ. You know about it. You know about him. But you don't know it the way God wants you to know it. God was so desperate for Abraham to feel the way he felt. He said, take your son, your only son, and take him up on a mountain where I will show you. Abraham gets there with his son, has the wood, has the fire. His son asks the pre-mount question, Father, where is the sacrifice? It was only then that as he raised the knife, he had to get him to the point of killing his son for Abraham to know what the heart of God felt like. Amen. Amen. That's when Abraham was convinced. He said, yep. Everything the Lord promised me is going to come to pass. Amen. Because I finally got to that point. Up until then, I kept trying to do it myself. I kept trying to work it out with my wife, Sarah. And it, 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 that was never it. God wanted you to trust him. God said, I want to finally place my endorsement on you. The woman recognizes who Elijah is. She recognizes who God is. God then uses the endorsement of the woman to encourage Elijah. Because the next chapter, Elijah doesn't have to convince a widow woman. He has to go up against 1,000 prophets of Baal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look at your God work. And God used the endorsement of a widow woman in Zarephath to embolden the heart of the man of God. Read the next chapter. Runs into Obadiah. He said, "Go call your king, and tell him that Abraham, that Ahab, tell Ahab that Elijah will show himself today. Amen. Only meet me up on Mount Carmel. Yeah. See when you're not sure. Oh, I love God. Yes. See when you're not sure, God will let you work it out yeah. in Zarephath. Yeah. Cause guess what? Ain't nobody looking yeah. in Zarephath." There's no prophets there. Nobody in private, in secret, God will let you work your gift out. And then when you have perfected it, God said your gift will bring you in front of great men. He goes from Zarephath to the height of Mount Karma and does in recorded history one of the greatest miracles known to humankind. And he did it because he got an endorsement from God. In spite of what she felt, Elijah gave her an endorsement from God. In spite of how he felt, this woman gave Elijah an endorsement from God. Amen. And Elijah goes to the, the mountaintop of prophetic ministry. He does what no army could do. He overthrows the prophets of Baal. And begins to return righteousness into Israel. It's Communion Sunday. And he said every time, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And I'm glad he said it because, like we all know, we so often forget. 
Forget what he gave. Forget what he's done. Even as close as last week, yesterday, we forget. And we immediately begin to take matters. God said, don't you know I'm ready to endorse you? Peter said, the very God, he's able to establish you, perfect you, and settle you. Amen. And I could, I, we could have went out on that. We could have been preaching in like a, a soul train line and just went out shouting. But what folks miss about that is what he says prior to that. After you have suffered a while. You got to be willing to go through Zarephath. You got to be willing to give up something of great value to you. First thing he ever told the Israelites, thou shall have no other gods before me. He said, if you do it, everything you gave up, God said, I'll give it back to you. Not just that, it'll come back pressed down. Shaken together. And we say it, we've got it memorized. But the real question is, do we believe it? Whoever you are, go the final step and receive the endorsement from God. Just one more miracle. That's all it's going to take. He sees you, knows where you've been, knows what you're going through now. And he's got one more miracle for you. That after this, then you'll know. Your testimony will be the widow's testimony. She said, now I know. We're going to prepare ourselves for the communion service.